All right, I will, uh, I, I think, go ahead and, and get this started here. Uh, we have, I think, 25 in the meeting right now. Uh, there's, there'll be three or four stragglers, I think, come in um, uh, here shortly. Um, but it's one o'clock, and, and so we'll go ahead and get started. I, I wanted to start just by welcoming you to uh, the agency version of user acceptance testing for Oak CI. Um, we have uh, done five sessions with the architects and uh, contractors, uh, construction contractors, and we wanted to also uh, do a, a similar kind of activity with our owner uh, team. So I appreciate everybody taking some time out this afternoon and, and next Thursday uh, to join us. Uh, <clears throat> let me actually get my PowerPoint back. You can see it, but I can't. Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, user acceptance testing, U UAT stands for user acceptance testing. And, and I'll tell you that this software has been uh, tested a lot already. Um, as we developed it over the past two years, our developers spent months literally uh, testing it as they built it. And then uh, we internally using our project coordinators and project managers as testers uh, spent over 500 hours in a, an internal user acceptance testing. Uh, and then uh, uh, back in March, we started doing uh, user acceptance testing uh, with our contractors and architects and uh, uh, wanted to work with our owner group as well. Uh, one of the things I know about software is no matter how much you test it, it still might not work right. And, and we have to make provisions for fixing it once we get it out in production and get it useful. Um, during our testing in these two uh, uh, sessions, we're going to be testing from an owner's perspective. Uh, we're going to spend um, uh, a, a little bit of time actually in the system itself where, where you guys will get hands on experience with version two. And in those sessions, you'll actually be in accounts that were uh, configured like a owner's rep or owner financial account would be configured. And in this case, all the accounts are, are basically set up with both sets of privileges. So <coughs> uh, that helps us identify when, when things come up from a permissions perspective that you should be able to see that you can't see or can see that you shouldn't be able to see or um, et cetera, et cetera. Think, think things break when you start using real permissions. And that's one of the things we'll be looking for. So thank you again for, for joining us. Um, the agenda looks kind of like this. We're going to talk a little bit initially about version two goals, uh, why we did version two in the first place and, and, and what we're expecting to get out of it uh, as we begin to implement it now. Um, we have navigation is going to look a little different when you get into the version two project. You're going to go in and say, hey, who moved my business processes? Uh, and we did, and, and we did it. Uh, with malice and forethought and, and good intentions, I think. Um, and then we're going to talk today about the differences and, and the updates that have been made to the contracting processes and the contract modification processes. <clears throat> and uh, that will that will wrap up what we'll have time for today. Next week, uh, we'll start with uh, kind of an in-depth look at what we're calling the funding business process. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, and then we'll uh, go through some of the, the traditional uh, financial processes, purchase orders and vouchers, and we'll look at the uh, changes to the application for payment business process. All the uh, business processes that got uh, reimagined, if, if you will, uh, application for payment is, is uh, it's going to look similar, but it, it's going to function very, very differently. So at the end of the day, people will still get paid, don't worry. Um, so that's kind of our agenda for the next two weeks. Uh, ideally, all of the participants will uh, be able to attend uh, both sessions. And, and if for some reason you can't attend one session or the other, that's OK. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is we are recording this session, uh, and that recording will be available on the OFCC website. If you go to the OFCC website, you'll see some, some kind of headline articles right now uh, related to the, the version 2 release. And if you follow those, then you will uh, find uh, not only the uh, recording from today, but also the recordings from the five sessions that we did with the architects and the contractors. So there's an opportunity to uh, look through those and, and learn a lot about the changes that we made with version two. Um, <clears throat> what we're, we're going to do from an agenda today is we're going to start with a, a PowerPoint uh, where we'll talk about the new features. Uh, in the various parts of OCI. 
Uh, then we're going to move to kind of a hands-on lab that we'll do using uh, our OCI test environment. Uh, those will be uh, facilitated by Shauna, Rita, and myself, and those will be done in smaller breakout groups. So everybody got two invitations today. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. So this is the one o'clock invitation, and, and you'll uh, uh, use it for uh, most of the meeting. Uh, when we break out into the breakout sessions, you'll actually leave this uh, team's meeting and go into the second meeting that you received, and that will be your, your breakout session with uh, Shauna or Rita or myself. Um, once you finish your breakout session, uh, you'll return. We're, we're going to have a, a kind of a participant debriefing where we want you to share your uh, thoughts and impressions and, and ideas in, in terms of what you've seen that we've uh, done with version two. Um, and that will actually take place in this meeting. Uh, so you'll you'll rejoin this meeting uh, from the original link and, and it'll bring you back here. And uh, we should wrap up uh, uh, if all things work well by three o'clock and uh, uh, be done by then. <coughs> uh, before I go into why we did it, uh, questions about what we covered so far. Anybody, uh, anybody have any questions? I was just curious who all is on the line. Um, that's a that's a, a a valid question. Uh, we we invited everybody who had uh, credentials as either an owner's rep or a uh, owner financial in, in in any of the agency OCI projects, um, and we got twenty eight responses of, of folks that wanted to join us. Um, pretty much distributed across all of the agencies that we do do a lot of work with. So uh, you can you can go to the participants uh, window uh, in Teams and, and see a list of all the participants that are here. I can tell you that we have uh, uh, eight or nine folks from DRC. Uh, we have uh, five each from mental health and ODOT. And then we have a, a, an assortment of additional folks, onesies and twosies, uh, representing community colleges, uh, universities, and, and some of the other agencies. So it's a, a very good representation, I think, of the owner community. And uh, I, I, I appreciate all of you uh, attending. <clears throat> OK, um, with that introduction, let, let's go ahead and talk about why we did it and, and, and what to kind of expect in general out of uh, OCI version two. Um, version two was really born about three years ago in, in a conversation that Craig Weesey and I had uh, in his office. Um, at the time, uh, the projects team was finishing up a uh, redesign of all of their work processes. And uh, Jerry Morgan had, had gone through with them and spent uh, over a year actually looking at every work process and looking at any differences there were between the way agency staff might do them. Uh, versus K-12 staff, and then identifying what the, the best, most efficient uh, way was and, and identifying those. And, and Craig asked a very reasonable question. He said, Steve, well, well, what will it take to move all these new work processes into OCI? And uh, I thought about that for a, a couple of minutes, probably. It seemed like a long time at, at, at the point, and I said, I, I think we have to rebuild it from the ground up. And that was really the conversation from which the idea to rebuild Oak CI from the ground up occurred. Um, basically, all of the business processes are, are new build business processes. In some cases, we may have initially taken a copy of an old business process and, and started from there. But in, in all cases, we, uh, we, we rebuilt things from the ground up. The first goal was to implement the OFCC work process redesign. And the goal of the OFCC work process redesign was to unify the agency higher ed and school facilities processes. Uh, if you are an agency, you, you probably have seen a unified process for a long time. But if you are one of the architects or uh, contractors that work with OFCC, uh, in many cases, things in OCI are different depending on whether you're working on a K-12 project or an agency project or a higher ed project. And uh, in version two, that will no longer be true. In, in version two, uh, all of the workflows, all of the ways that you handle documents, uh, and so on and so forth, are going to be consistent. Uh, and so, as a consequence, uh, a lot of things change. 
uh, both for the agency and for the K-12 end users, because we we really tried to pick the best of breed processes and, and the best of breed uh, forms and, and be as efficient as possible. That brings me to goal number three, which was to improve end user efficiency. And end user really means all of our, our end users of Oak CI, whether that's our internal project coordinators and project managers, our agency owner staff, uh, our architects, our, our contractors. Uh, we wanted to, to get uh, as much efficiency out of the rebuild as we could. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was enhance our support for CMR and design build. Uh, those came along, and, and when they were when they were first authorized and, and first new methodologies, that there was a lot of um, question about exactly how things would operate and whatnot. And we built them into the existing uh, version of OCI the best we could. And to be honest, there, there were a lot of holes in the way we supported them, and, and just just a lot of, of shortcomings there. So we paid a lot of attention as we did the rebuild to how to do a good job of supporting our CMR and design build processes. <clears throat> and then we had, uh, since we first built uh, OCI, we, we had had uh, Unifier uh, purchased by Oracle. Uh, Oracle did a, a tremendous amount of work on it, uh, some of which we loved and some of which we didn't. But, but nonetheless, uh, there were a lot of new Unifier features that we wanted to take advantage of. So we uh, very specifically went into the rebuild with the idea of looking at some of those new features and utilizing them where we could. Uh, going back to the top line, we're, we're looking to implement the OFCC work process redesign and consequentially uh, version two is at this point uh, for OFCC administered projects only. So as, as agency staff, when you do your locally administered project, you won't be using any of the version two business processes <coughs> and, and you'll continue to use something that looks a lot like what you use today. Um, as we go forward, however, uh, we'll have opportunities to do a couple of things. We can take some of the, the non-work process features uh, that we've built into version two and back migrate them in, into the VPs that you're using today. Uh, and we can also uh, have every intention of sitting down uh, in the second half of this year, uh, starting with, with the, the ACO group and uh, <coughs> working through a similar process in terms of can we can we develop work process wise at a, best work process set practices for local admin and, and then implement those in a remake of OCI for local administration. <clears throat> so uh, initially off CC administered only uh, and in the future uh, we'll migrate down into locally administered type projects for agency. Just a little more detail, the, the work pro process redesign um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, implements our redesign work processes. Some of the things that came out of that uh, were a common document manager, and, and we're actually going to look at the common document manager in lab today because it's going to look completely different than the document manager that you have on your projects today. We adopted the K-12 document manager um, and, and, and brought that into um, the agency environment. Uh, one of the nice things about the K-12 document manager is you can always load documents from your desktop to uh, any business process and they store automatically in the document manager. And uh, it's a much more efficient way to upload documents than uploading them to the document manager and then attaching them to a record. So for any end user that, that uploads documents, that was, a, that was an efficiency improvement. Um, wanted to make the end user experience more consistent and more efficient. And uh, I, I ask all of my UAT folks to uh, think about that as, as you're work, working through the UAT environment in the labs. Uh, is the work process clear, easy to use, and, and efficient? Uh, if there are ways to make the work processes better, uh, then those are the things that we want to discuss in, in the debriefing uh, later in the day and, and even in the lab session. Um, there's actually a ton of new business processes that, that you simply don't find in the original version of OCI. Um, we, we have several for CMR and design build support, uh, which include in, in the procurement process, criteria, RFP, uh, proposal response, and best value selection uh, business processes. We have a, a nifty business process um, called contract times. Uh, that actually keeps track of the milestones associated with each GMP amendment. 
<coughs> so in a CMR or a design build project, you may have multiple milestones and those can be uh, modified by change orders. So Oak CI supports all that now. And uh, in, in version two, there's actually a VP you can go to and see what the, the deadline for each milestone is. Uh, we added a uh, supplemental instructions business process, a miscellaneous expense business process, um, and, and then a, a couple of additional project communication business processes with the, the conceptual idea that OCI is, is the construction management system of record and that all of the uh, <coughs> processes that take place should be documented there. So as you get test results in, you might have previously stored them somewhere in the document manager. Uh, now you'll upload them to the test results business process and they'll get stored in a consistent place in the document manager. Uh, one feature that agency staff probably haven't seen a lot of, K-12 staff had a fair amount of this in, in their, their build out of OCI. Um, we can put instructions on forms and in version two, we set a standard which basically said that for all forms, we should have an instruction block and it should tell the end user when they when they get the record, why they got the record, uh, what we want them to do with it, and then what workflow actions that they can take. And again, in, in the UAT, if you're looking at an owner step um, and, and you read the what you need to do and you think, oh, that's not a very good description of what I do. I, I do these other things too. Uh, those are things to share with us because uh, all of the instructions were obviously written um, they, 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 they were born of IT, uh, and, and I think we have a, a good understanding of the processes, but by no means do I think we have a complete understanding of the processes. So as you uh, uh, look at the instructions and see things that are maybe deficient there, uh, we can improve those very, very easily, and, and we would encourage you to uh, share those thoughts with us so we can, we can do that. <coughs> I think... Uh, as you bring new people into your organization that haven't necessarily used OCI before, uh, the instructions become an important tool for bringing them up to speed. And it's just going to make it a, a whole lot easier to bring new folks into uh, being OCI users. And we've talked about the document manager a little bit before. Um, there is now one common document manager similar to the uh, existing K-12 structure. Uh, Auto publishing on all business processes and uh, most directories are automatically created by the auto publishing process. So we, we started off with just the top level directories uh, and, and the associated permissions on them and then everything else gets created uh, when it's needed. And that kind of minimizes one of the issues we had with the old agency environment in particular, which is there's always tons of empty directories out there and finding things is difficult to do because you got to sort through all of the various directories and whatnot. Uh, we did some work with permissions in the document manager uh, in order to limit access <laughs> to some documents. And we'll show you some of that in the lab this afternoon. Um, one of the things that we we're trying to do is when we have multiple contractors on the same project, uh, we wanted to limit their ability to see each other's uh, documents and, and pay requests and so on and so forth. So we had always been able to do that pretty well in the uh, uh, business processes themselves, but the document manager, everybody could see everything uh, in the existing original version of OCI. In version two, that's no longer the case. And in some cases, the only way to get to documents, if you're an architect or, or a construction contractor, is to go through the business process because we just don't give you access to see uh, the documents in the document manager, that whole whole directory is blocked. Uh, and, and basically that's that's to uh, keep some of that data a little bit more, uh, a little bit less accessible. All right, questions before I go on. That's kind of the, 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 the story of how OCI uh, version two happened and what we're trying to do. Start looking at features next. All right, hearing no questions. Um, one of the first things you'll notice when you go into Oak CI is that the BPs aren't actually there anymore, but that you have these, these kind of groups. So under 
under logs, you're going to see procurement, financial, contracts and agreements, modifications, payments. Um, and basically what we did is we adopted a hierarchical structure for the business processes. There are about 50 to 60 business processes and it just made a, a really, really long list to work through. And then you can see even an example I have here, I have the contracts and agreement section open and we have, uh, we've taken our, our contracts BP and we now have a best value contracts, a trade contracts and a professional services agreements. Um, those in an alphabetical list fall all over the list and we wanted to bring those together uh, so when you go in to start a, a contract you know oh yeah it's either best value or trade that, that's what we called it in, in version two and, and both options are right there together uh, for you to look at uh, so uh, when you get into lab you'll have an opportunity to go in and, and open up uh, some of these various uh, areas and see what business processes are on there all you do is you click the plus um you get a cursor over here you, you click the plus sign and it opens up you click the minus sign and it closes down uh, when you leave a particular project shell and come back uh, you're going to come back it's going to be configured the way you had left it uh, so basically while you're going through the contracts process you have that open once the contracts are all done you close that off and and maybe you have payments open or modifications open uh, and, and you have the records that you need in front of you and the records that you're done with uh, or haven't gotten to are, are somewhat hidden. <coughs> so that was conceptually what we were trying to do. Uh, you will obviously only see nodes that you have uh, permissions to access, uh, but everybody in the owner group has permission to access virtually all the nodes anyway. And, and so you're, you're going to see pretty much what you see here on my screen. Uh, one thing I would point out is um, existing projects that are being done in the original version of OCI will finish in the original version of OCI. Um, new projects, basically projects that, that, that are uh, new now, uh, will get started in version two. So during the remainder of this year and probably a lot of 2022, you're going to have projects in both systems. And one of the way you, you can tell what system am I in, am I in an original version of OCI or version two, is all of the business processes for version two have the V2 at the end of the business process name. So PS agreements, V2, best value contracts, V2, et cetera. Um, and so if you, if you look at your VPs and it doesn't say V2, then you're in an original version. If you look at your VPs and it says V2, then you're in a, in a version two shell. And uh, so that's the best way to, to figure out which of the two systems you're in. And uh, uh, that may affect what capabilities you have uh, uh, available to you. Talk a little bit about, or we'll actually start talking about the contracting business processes and um, conceptually, we divided the work differently. Um, in an existing agency version of OCI, uh, when we go and get a contract, we get the contract document, we get the funding all together. Uh, if it happens to be an agreement, uh, we, we not only get the uh, agreement document and the funding, but that work process also creates the schedule of values. So when you have your, your completed uh, agreement, uh, you, you have a schedule of values that basically can, can do a pay request uh, and you already have, have funded it and all that was in one business process. Conceptually with version two, we're, we're trying to have consistent business processes between agency and, and K-12 <laughs> and K-12's funding processes are very different. And we, we, we started trying to build this thing and, and trying to be consistent and we were we were struggling um, and had a meeting and, and and one of the ideas that kind of popped out on the table was hey why don't we take the funding processes and put them in their own BP <laughs> and uh, uh, after much consternation and and, and uh, it, that started to make sense and, and the more we played with it the more sense it made so for all types of business processes, 
uh, on all types of contracts, uh, we have basically divided the contract into three different business processes. So there's one that's going to manage the contract document itself, getting getting the piece of paper done. <laughs> and we broke those into three different BPs. There's one for agreements. There's one for trade contracts, your, your general uh, contractor contract or a multi-fine contract. And then there's one for best value contracts. And by best value contracts, I'm speaking of uh, either a CMR uh, or a design build uh, type of contract. Uh, the data that we collect in, in each of those types of contracts is very, very different. And it just made sense from a forms perspective to create each of those in their own specific business process. So where you're used to having agreements and contracts in version two, you're gonna have agreements, trade contracts and or best value contracts. Um, in all cases, the schedule of values will be in a separate BP uh, called contract as uh, SOB, contract schedule of values. Uh, and that's very similar to what we used to do with contracts, but have not previously done with agreements. And we've uh, we, we've moved agreements into that that same kind of uh, of a setup, so that you'll get the document first, and then you'll go back in after you get the document, and you'll create the contract SOV record. And then the third area was funding, and we pulled funding out, and, and we actually have a funding BP that supports not only all the contract documents. But it would also support some of the modification uh, types of activities like a GMP amendment or uh, if you were doing a, a change order that you were going to fund through a purchase order as opposed to one that you were going to fund through an ENC or or existing funding that was already set up, <coughs> you could use the VP there as well. So I, I would I would roughly say that the funding VP uh, is our rec letter process for agency and uh, so you're going you're gonna to see that different breakout of work and we'll kind of walk through and, and look at some of these VPs in, in more uh, uh, more detail now and, and again next week. Let's start off with just one slide on the funding BP. Uh, funding is a new BP. It separates funding activities from the associated contract documents uh, and it's basically an agency only process. And we actually put three sub processes into it. So um there is a contract and or release and permit number assignment process uh so we're we're uh, we're, we're going to get you your contract number release and permit number in the funding business process uh we're going to do an admin fee calculation and uh previously under the original version of OCI admin fee calculations were, were typically done by the project coordinator and uh we wanted a system that that um, would, would take that load off of them and, and would hopefully assure that the rec letter and, and the fees later on agree with each other. So we actually send our funding BP to an external program. It's the same program that does billing for you and, and it does the fee calculation in, in the billing program and then returns the fees right submitted the business process. So we're using uh, web services and, and an, external Java, an external Java program to do the fee calculation. <clears throat> Once the fee calculation is done, uh, then it goes back to the project coordinator. Um, and from this BP, they would create your rec letter and, and uh, you'll receive a rec letter just like you were used to receiving. And uh, so this creates a rec letter. It doesn't replace the rec letter. Um, we will talk about the funding VP in a lot more detail next Thursday in the second session. So I, I've got about 10 or 15 slides and, and we'll go into it in a lot of detail. Uh, but but right now I just wanted to introduce it and the whole idea that, hey, there's there's a new BP out there and it's it's going to take care of the funding activities and it kind of isolates those. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've separated agreements and contracts into three separate VPs, uh, really looking at making forms and workflows specific uh, to each of those different kinds of contracts. And it, it simplified greatly the maintenance of those business processes from uh, our perspective. And I think in terms of when you actually go in and look at the business processes in OCI now, uh, there aren't a lot of blank uh 
blocks of data because this particular block doesn't apply to the type of thing that you're doing right now. Uh, everything will be filled out, everything will be complete, and everything will, will be more, more usable, I think. Um, it also provides for full support of the CMR and design build methodologies. <coughs> we'll look a little bit at that in a couple of slides. Um, mentioned this earlier, I'm going to say it in red bold here. Um, the agreements BP no longer contains a schedule values. So when you see an agreements BP, that the schedule values isn't there. Uh, after the agreement is signed, uh, then the uh, coordinator and, and the uh, uh, professional services provider will go back in and get the schedule values together and get it entered. Uh, so in place of the schedule values, you'll see uh, similar to what you see today on the contract BP, uh, a, uh, a single line item uh, associated with an SOV pending description uh, for the amount of the contract. If you guys have questions, you can jump in here on any of these pauses between slides. So. I uh, don't feel like you have to hold on to them. Um, for <coughs> competitive selection uh, workflow uh, for, for an AE, um, the, the workflow uh, looks like this. Um, some of the changes that we made in the workflow, um, the vendor review step is now in DocuSign. Uh, previously, we had had the vendor look at all of the AE stuff in, in OCI, and then again in DocuSign. Uh, and similarly, the program manager review has been moved to DocuSign only. Um, so we took two steps out of the workflow in OCI uh, because they were redundant with, with steps that were in, in DocuSign. Um, uh, as, an, as an agency owner, uh, you weren't in the workflow previously, and you will continue to sign agreements in, in DocuSign. So you'll see those come to you in DocuSign. You do have access when you get that DocuSign record and you have a, a question uh, maybe uh, about it, you do have access to the OCI record. You can go in and, and uh, review the OCI record, review the uh, documents that, that support that particular agreement uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all that is, uh, is available to you in OCI. <coughs> um, in addition to a competitive selection, uh, workflow. We had a consultant list workflow where uh, the project is picking somebody off of the uh, uh, AE consultant list. And uh, there are actually no changes to that workflow from what we have in the original version of OCI. Uh, that workflow was developed for the consultant list uh, relatively recently, and, and we kind of anticipated some of the things we were going to do there. So there's, there's no changes to that particular workflow. One of the additions, and we'll talk about this a lot more next week, um, but in a lot of our business processes, we've added uh, a new tab that it, it, it's a type of tab that we call a query tab. And basically what it does is it'll go to another business process and bring back all the related records. So in this case, we've put a query tab in place to purchase order. If you go in and look at your agreements uh, and you click over to the purchase orders tab, then you will see uh, the actual purchase order records for uh, all of those uh, particular agreements. And for some reason, when I pulled the slide together, I, I, I uh, have the record on, on the general tab instead of on the purchase order tab. Next week, when we look at these, I'll actually show you what that purchase order tab looks like. But this will let you see all of the purchase orders that are associated with this agreement. Uh, it also, and maybe more importantly, it lets you create a purchase order to be associated with this agreement. And when you do that, uh, a lot of the information auto populates into the purchase order. And uh, so it's a, a much faster way to create purchase orders. And we'll go through those in detail next week. Uh, so in addition to agreements, we have the, the two contract BPs, uh, trade and best value. Uh, trade contracts support GC and multi-prime. Best value contracts support CMR uh, and design build. <coughs> uh, workflow wise, uh, they're, they're actually almost identical. Uh, but again, I, I want to point out some of the, the workflow efficiency things we did. Uh, we removed the vendor review step. Uh, we used to have an SOV approval verification step. So basically, we held the contract until the schedule of values uh, was approved. 
And then you had to go back into the contract record and tell it that the schedule of values has been approved. And uh, we, we just have eliminated that step altogether. Uh, and then the vendor, uh, again, will sign the contract documents in DocuSign. So the vendor review step is no longer necessary. Um, and like we talked about in agreements, the owner will continue to sign contracts in, in DocuSign, whether they're uh, multi-prime or uh, CMRDB. So the, the best value workflow or the CMRDB workflow uh, is exactly the same from a workflow perspective. And uh, again, we removed the vendor review and the SOB uh, approval steps and uh, <coughs> made what's hopefully gonna be a, a quicker and more efficient workflow to get through. Couple of things that we did to the forms, uh, and these are, are gonna be of particular interest, I think, to the owners. Um, in the beginning, we had, uh, I think, five alternates uh, on the uh, contract form. And, and it wasn't very long until somebody came to me and said they needed, you know, more alternates than five because their, their, their project needed seven. Uh, and so we increased it to 10. And, and that worked pretty well. We, we used 10 for quite a few years before anybody came up with a, a contract that needed more than 10. Uh, and, and when that happened, we, we increased it to 20. And I thought 20 has got to be enough, right? Uh, no, somebody came to me uh, and it was it was a K-12 project, to be honest, but a K-12 project came to me and they had more than 20 alternates uh, that they wanted to uh, put on a contract. And we were trying to figure out how to do that. So when we redesigned OCI, we said enough is enough. Uh, we moved all of the alternates to the lower form or, or, or to a tab because uh, it is not the lower form anymore. Uh, it's just hard to get out of my vocabulary moved all the alternates to be their own tab and so you can now have an unlimited number of alternates uh, listed on the tab uh, those alternates will all be added up amount wise and that they'll be carried up to the upper form and uh or up uh form and and added into the the total for the contract uh, so when you're looking for well what alternates are on this particular uh contract uh, you'll have to look at the alternates tab to find that We also, uh, and it's on my next slide, but I'm going to show it to you right here. The, the tab next to alternates is the bonds detail tab. And uh, so we move bond and surety information onto the lower, uh, on, onto its own tab as well. Uh, if you only have a single surety agent, a single bond, uh, you still put that on the upper form where it was before in the event that you're one of the very few projects that have multiple uh, surety agents and multiple sureties, then uh, we have you use the, the tab on the lower form. And uh, when you when you do that, it actually causes some uh, issues for some of our custom friends, uh, but it, it does let us retain the information that way. So uh, we have a very small number of projects that need more than one uh, set of bond and surety information. And we, uh, have provided a way to do that. <laughs> All right, questions before I go into SOV processes and contract modifications. <clears throat> All right, hearing no questions. Somebody tell me that you're actually still out there because I can't see you and I don't know whether whether anybody's still on the line or not. <laughs> Definitely still out here. You're doing yeah, a great job. Outstanding. That's one of, one of the challenges yeah. with doing these teams meetings is, is you can't see anybody. And they all went to sleep on me. Um, okay, so we talked about SOV processes. Um, one of the improvements that we made is agreements, trade contracts, and best value contracts now all spawn a contract SOV record for completion. And uh, the project coordinator will actually enter the SOV uh, based on either the contract documents in the case of an agreement or on a spreadsheet that gets provided by the, the contractor and the project manager. So we basically say to the contractor, go work out your schedule of values, share it with your project manager, get it, get it right, and then give it to the project coordinator who will actually set up the, the schedule of values for you. And uh, that uh, has a it has several uh, improvements 
uh, we used to have them actually run a macro. Um, we had the contractor run a macro to get the schedule values import file. And a lot of uh, companies are very leery about running macros from, from anywhere, even their own uh, in this day and age. And I don't blame them. Uh, so we, we kind of brought that, hey, we can run the macro uh, for you. You don't have to run the macro at all. All you have to do is provide the data. Um, and it just provides for a lot more consistency in terms of, of getting the data in. This is actually work process wise, the way that K-12 has done it uh, since we first set up the K-12 system six years ago. And we've just always had that discrepancy in, in how it got done between agency and K-12. So this is a, a consistency kind of thing to, to bring uh, the agency uh, process in line with the, with the K-12 process and have one. And you may hear you know some of your some of your contractors talking about it and, and if you do that's that's what's going on uh, like we did with the contract bps uh we dispersed the contract modification bps similarly so in the agency environment we, we previously had uh change order and professional services amendment change order was a swiss knife swiss army knife of, of oci uh, it had like eight different work processes that did all kinds of different things in it. And uh, so that was partly because we only had the ability to have one change order BP for a particular type of contract SOV. One of those enhancements that they did the unifier uh, was to relieve us of that restriction. Uh, so we said, hey, let's let's redesign our contract modification BPs and break them out to do what what they need to do. So you can see on the box on the right, we ended up with five business processes where we used to have two. And I'm going to tell you that's a, that's a, that's a better arrangement. So we have change directive, change order. Uh, we have amendment, GMP amendment, and contract times. I'll talk a little bit in, in the slides here about each of those. Um, first of all, change directives is now about the document. Um, and, and it's no longer a, a, a cost type BP at all. So it doesn't affect the schedule. Uh, of values directly. Uh, change directives may be signed in DocuSign. That's an interesting thought. Um, so basically, we're, we're allowing two ways to do a change directive. One is on paper, basically it gets passed around the table and, and signed there. Uh, and the second way is to uh, create a, a form uh, and then pass it around uh, the table in DocuSign and, and get a, a signed change directive that way. So depending on the availability of staff to actually sign off on it, uh, you can do it either of those two ways. Um, the change directive record at OCI basically asks you to um, attach uh, either the DocuSign file or the scan of the, the paper uh, to the change directive record, and it then becomes part of the record of the project. <coughs> either, either of the workflows, um, we can issue a we can spawn a change order so if if there's something about this particular change directive where you want to have a change order associated with it you can spawn that change order directly and the uh, change order will actually go to the architect and the architect then will be in, in charge of uh, completing the change order and, and continuing that change order process and i'll show you um, Depending on whether your your paper issued, which is literally just attach and, and go, uh, or or the second workflow goes through DocuSign, uh, where you would actually create the form and uh, have it reviewed by the PM, and then the coordinator would send it out as a DocuSign document. So obviously uh, not quite as fast of a uh, process, not, not as agile as a paper issued process, but we'll uh, support either of them going forward. Uh, so we'll move from from change directives to GMP amendments and uh, uh, one of the considerations we had one of one of the complaints I have heard about the old change order business process was when you go and look at the OCI change order log it's all this stuff in it that's not change orders and so many of our architects kept their own change order log outside of OCI and uh, uh, would not use the OCI change order log because it confused them with all the extra stuff in there. So as we built version two, we pulled out GMP amendments and subcontract distributions from change order. And so GMP amendments is now uh, a new 
process that processes both the GMP amendment itself and the subcontract distributions that follow it. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the overall process, the, the GMP amendment basically authorizes the, the, the funds for certain work packages. And then the, the contractor goes out and uh, entertains bids and, and gets contractors to do the, the various work packages. And once they have those, then they change the, the basically lump sum money in the GMP amendment in, into a work breakdown structure that the subcontractor is going to deal with um, in, in the subcontract distribution. <laughs> so they they uh, basically give us the detail of, of the work that's going to be done and, and what it's going to cost. By uh, putting those both in the GMP Amendment BP, we keep them out of the change order log and keep them together in one place. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time before people get used to that and get used to thinking, I need to do a subcontract distribution. That's in GMP Amendments, it's not in change order. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to get some help desk calls asking, where, 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 where's the subcontract distribution uh, workflow? It, it's not here. Uh, it's in GMP amendment. So the uh, schedule of values entry, both for the GMP amendment, uh, is done by the project coordinator, and that's just part of the, the documentation of the GMP amendment itself. Uh, all the entries on the SOV come right out of the GMP document. So it's kind of a, an easy transfer there, and they get that process started. Um, the CMR or the design builder actually initiates the subcontractor distribution record. And we've given them a, a, an extra option in, in how they do that. In, in the original version of OCI, when you did a subcontract distribution, uh, you had to go ahead and put the uh, uh, all of the SOV entry directly into OCI. And as soon as you did that and passed it on, it locked the schedule of values and you couldn't do a pay request. So, We've modified it so that you can provide a spreadsheet with the schedule of values changes in it and delay the actual entry of them until the, the last step that the PC does. And it basically eliminates uh, schedule of values locking when you do it that way. And so we've instructed both, both the CMRs and the coordinators that work with each other and on projects where you need to uh, limit locking of the SOV uh, this is a good way to do it. And uh, as long as everybody knows what's going on, uh, it'll work. Obviously, when you get to the last step, if you haven't put your SOV in, uh, OCI is, is, is not going to let you go on. It's going to look for that last step. So, and there's a specific import template for the, the version two uh, GMP amendment or subcontract distributions. <coughs> um, Contract times milestones are entered in the contract times tab of the GMP amendment. And uh, then there's a companion BP called the contract times BP. Contract times maintains all of the contract times milestones established by each GMP amendment. So there'll be one record in contract times for each record in GMP amendment. So if you do two GMP amendments during a project, you'll get two records in contract times. Uh, if you have five milestones in GMP1, uh, all five of those milestones will be tracked in the contract times record that uh, maps to it. And uh, this is set up so that you can go into change order and, and also modify uh, the due dates of, of all of those GMP amendments or all those GMP amendment milestones. <coughs> so if you can see my uh, uh, graphic here, uh, this is just a, a look at, this is the GMP amendment business process itself, and you can see you have the general tab and then the standard tab next to it, uh, which deals with the cost breakout, and the contract times uh, tab deals with the uh, milestone breakout and, and any changes you might make to it. And over on the right, you can see that we allowed this milestone 120 calendar days from the uh, GMP proceed date. And uh, we come up with the original completion date that way. So that's this is the GMP amendments look at contract times. And then on the next slide, I'm going to switch and go to the contract times business process. And uh, this is uh, uh, similar in that if you look at the, the data on the right side, you can see that it's copied in the GMP amendment proceed date. 
Uh, we've copied in the milestone calendar days, so, so how much time we have to get to the original completion date. And then we have two additional fields there, a, a total milestone stays changed and a revised completion date. Uh, so you only get an update to those fields when you have an approved change order that references uh, one of the contract times on a GMP amendment. So in, in this case, when I pulled this particular slide, there were not any of those. The notice uh, up at the top, contract times version two, general tab, uh, the contract times tab, which we're looking at, and there's also a change order tab. What that change order tab will do, it's a query tab again, that will show you all the change orders that have uh, impacted the milestone uh, date for this particular uh, set of milestones. So you can go and see not only that, hey, we added 10 days here, but what change order actually added those days? And when did that happen? Uh, GMP amendment workflow, this workflow is going to start looking really, really familiar with you. We create it, we have the PM look at it, and then we put it in DocuSign and, and route it to everybody. Um, and again, the owner will sign the GMP amendment in DocuSign. And again, uh, I'll say it again, uh, you can go into OCI and look at all the backup and uh, et cetera in the, the record in OCI. Um, just because you aren't receiving the record in OCI doesn't mean that you can't see it there. You have permissions to see everything. Um, moving on to the subcontract distributions. So after the GMP amendment has been executed, um, we'll start to do the subcontract distributions. And those are, uh, again, initiated by the CMR or the design builder. Um, they're going to use an import template uh, in most cases because the, the, a lot of these have a fair number of lines on them. And either the CMR can import it or they can attach it and let the, the PC import it. So kind of all information I gave you before. Uh, the workflow uh, for subcontract distribution is, is pretty much unchanged from what it was before. So once the, the uh, record is created, then the AE and the PM review it. And then the project coordinator will do validation on it and they'll uh, import the SOV if necessary. So that's workflow is not really changed from the original version of OCI. Question about the GMP processes. <coughs> All right, if I talk really fast, I, I'm going to get this uh, whole slide deck in by two o'clock. Um, glad I. Eliminated a few slides from it before we started. Um, change order process. First of all, change order no longer supports change directives, GMP amendments, and subcontract distributions. What's left is proposal requests, requests for change order, and contingency consumption requests. So basically, your your true change order type activities, and uh, they can be spawned either from a change director or from an RFI. Uh, if that's the case, they're going to go to the AE for evaluation. And in any fund situation in OCI, you get a task on your uh, task list. So the AE will get a task that he's received a change order uh, for evaluation. And then the AE would be responsible for going in and, and moving that along uh, or terminating it or, or whatever uh, was appropriate in that particular case. Um, and they'll then follow just a standard proposal request process with the contractor, uh, which is the way change directives have, have always worked. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about change orders being available to, to do a contract times change. Uh, one of the tabs on the change order, let me get my pointer over here. Uh, first of all, there, there's two different forms of the change order BP, depending on what kind of project you're on. Uh, if, if you're on a uh, best value kind of project, then you'll get this one and it's going to have a uh, uh, GMP contract times tab on it. And that's where you would go in and, and make a change. So in this particular case, uh, we had a milestone for substantial completion uh, and the current milestone is October the 31st of, of 2019. Uh, and we added via this change order 30 days to it. So. Um, you can make modifications to contract times in a change order without making modifications to the schedule values and, and the dollars. Uh, you can also do both at the same time. 
um, that this is now going to give you a, a revised completion date of November 30th of 2019. Um, again, we, we've talked about this with GMP amendment that the same thing is true under change orders. Um, the schedule of values may be entered by the project coordinator at the DocuSign load step instead of being entered by the um, contractor uh, when, when they do their step. And what that does basically is to eliminate uh, issues with locking the SOV so we can process change orders at the same time we're processing pay requests. Um, <coughs> and we actually have a a, uh, 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 a document and, and I didn't pull it up today. I, I pulled it up for the uh, architects and the contractors, but uh, uh, we have, we have a, a special document. So it's basically the change order uh, document that you're used to seeing and it has an extra tab on it that has the SOB uh, implications on it. They, they simply put them on that document and uh, then the coordinator will take care of entering them when they get there. So. PS amendments is now a standalone BP separate from contract modifications. Um, it's always been the case for agency anyway. Uh, scheduled value changes may be entered by the project coordinator on the DocuSign docu docu load step again. So amendments are basically set up the same way as uh, contracts are. Um, in the case of an amendment where, where uh, we may need to do additional funding, uh, again, the rec letter creation and then the funding process is handled in the funding BP. And we'll, uh, we'll look at those next week. So. Owners, uh, again, will sign amendments and change orders in DocuSign, uh, and you do have access to review those BPs uh, whenever you want to. <coughs> okay, um, so we have about three minutes for questions. Any, any questions from the overall group in terms of anything we've talked about up to here? OK, uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to give you a chance to uh, touch uh, version two. Um, so we're going to move to three breakout sessions in a few minutes. Don't go yet. Um, and, and we'll allow um, 30 to 45 minutes today um, <clears throat> in the breakout session. Uh, so you'll either go to a, a session that will be facilitated by Sean, Arita, or myself. Um, and then you will, uh, after you finish that breakout session, you're going to return to this meeting. So what you're going to do uh, in terms of your team's meeting is you're going to leave this meeting uh, in a minute, uh, go back to mail, get the second meeting that I sent you, the, the meeting that started at 1.30 and, and was of uh, shorter duration, and join that meeting. And uh, we'll, we'll end that meeting, but we'll, we'll uh, do some hands-on work and then when that meeting is over, you'll leave that meeting and literally come back to this meeting. So you'll rejoin this meeting. Um, we'll have this uh, URL for you uh, in the sub meeting, so you don't have to write it down. But we're going to use our training environment for testing. This is the URL for our training environment. Uh, we will also have a, uh, a student account for you to log into. And uh, once you're in that student account, you're going to be uh, you're going to have both owner rep and owner financial permission groups. So uh, whatever it is we happen to be doing, you'll have the permissions to do it, uh, but you won't have like God permissions like we we oftentimes test with. Uh, once you get there, uh, you're going to find that we have set up three uh, projects for testing, and those projects all start with UAT. So if you go in and and, and click like uh, uh, we've done on this slide, um, and you type in UAT, the projects that are available will come up. And, while there happen to be three projects here, the projects you will see are not the three that are there. Uh, they're they're going to be uh, the three that are listed down here lower on the slide. So uh, they'll all be UAT-21s. And uh, today we're not actually creating any records. Uh, so while Shauna and Rita and I generally stay in separate projects today, we can we can wander to any of the projects that happen to have a, a record that we want to look at and uh, use. <coughs> so 
as I said, you should have received a, a separate Teams meeting invite for the breakout session, and we'll have you leave this meeting. And then uh, when your breakout session is complete, you'll leave it and return to this meeting. So questions before I tell you to leave this meeting? Hearing none. Um, Steve, what time do you want us to meet? I want to come back here. I think uh, let's try to be back here by 20 minutes to three. So, okay. so let's take 40 minutes. Gotcha. And Sean and Rita, I don't know if you saw it or not, but the uh, and here I'll just I'll just put it up here. Uh, this particular file is is available for you guys to pick up. Uh, in, in our shared file area. It's called uh, Agency Version 2 Registration List. Uh, but the uh, the tab that I have here has uh, the assignments for each of the groups. So it'll have the URL to log into, passwords are version two for all of these accounts. And then there's uh, there's 10 accounts and I've just assigned each of you uh, in each of the groups to an account. So you can see, somebody was wanting to see a list of all the people that were here. There's a list of all the people that signed up. So once you get into your uh, individual session, we'll display this again, and uh, then you can get get yourself logged in. All right. If there's no questions, you may go ahead and, and leave this session. And I, I think uh, Brett's going to hang around on this session for for the next 40 minutes to make sure it stays alive, and, and then we'll come back into the session when we're done. <laughs>